So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in the second talk uh, of the series on mathematical uh, biology. Uh, I will briefly introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor uh, Francesco Regazzoni from uh, Politecnico di Milano. Uh, Francesco got his PhD from uh, Politecnico di Milano under the supervision of uh, Professor Alfio Quarteroni, a pillar in numerical uh, analysis. Uh, he has been a visiting scholar at Enelia Saclay Ile de France, Pennsylvania State University and University of Graz. He's currently junior assistant professor in numerical analysis and Politecnico di Milano. And his research interests cover the mathematical modeling and numerical <coughs> approximation of multi-scale models, uh, in particular related to cardiovascular modeling and uh, uh, the synergies between machine learning and numerical uh, analysis. He has been awarded several international prizes, including the ECOMAS Best PhD Thesis Award and the VPH Young Investigator uh, Award. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us today, Professor Rigazzoni. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for this kind introduction. And uh, I'm really happy for this opportunity of presenting uh, my work and the work uh, um, of my colleagues. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to present uh, is uh, a, a virtual heart uh, that is a mathematical and numerical model of uh, uh, the human heart. And first starting, uh, let me uh, briefly introduce the framework in which uh, this work has been carried out. It is uh, uh, iHeart. Uh, iHeart uh, is a, a research project uh, uh, founded by the European Union under a NRC advance grant, uh, uh, guided um, by the supervision of Professor uh, Alfio Quarteroni. And uh, I reported here the proposal of this project that was that of construct, mathematical analyze, numerical approximate, computationally solve and validate on clinical data a mathematically based integrated model of the human cardiac function. So we are talking about a mathematical model of the human cardiac function. Later, we will see what do we mean by that. And by this presentation, I will try to uh, follow all of these pipeline of the construction, anal mathematical analysis, numerical approximation, solution, and validation of this model. So this is the sketch that I will follow. So first of all, let me start with uh, a very brief introduction on the anatomy of the heart and the physiology of the heart. Because whenever you have to uh, construct a mathematical model, you have to start from what you want to model. So let us start by this topic. So as you know, as you may know, the, the, the heart is a muscle whose function is to pump blood through the body. Uh, the heart is split into four chambers. We have two atria and two ventricles, left atrium, right atrium, left ventricle, and right ventricle. And the contraction of the heart is due to uh, very specialized cells that are called the cardiomyocytes, which are very special cells because they are able to contract and to generate an active force. And the contraction of the cells is driven by an electric signal. So the trigger of the heart contraction is an electric signal. Indeed, we talk about cardiac electrophysiology. It is the phenomenon by which an electrical phenomenon uh, triggers the contraction of uh, the muscle. And we say that this is a multi-scale phenomenon because we have very different spatial scales involved in this phenomenon. So the, the heart uh, has the scale of centimeters, Okay, but the phenomenon, the phenomena that explains his behavior has a, a much finer scale that is that of the nanometer or even less. Indeed, when you want to construct a mathematical model, you have to start from a very fine scale that is the flux of ions across uh, the so-called ion channels that uh, are across the, the heart membrane. And when you construct a mathematical model, you start from this, then you upscale to the membrane that have several channels, then you upscale even more and you go to the scale of uh, 
of the, a cell and you construct a mathematical model for the cell, then you put many cells together and then you, you are modeling this way the cardiac tissue, okay, by considering the interaction between cells. And then by climbing up the scales, you finally reach the organ. And the heart work in a cyclical manner, okay, it pumps blood many, many times, nearly one times each second of our life. And to characterize this behavior, clinicians typically use the so-called PV loops that are the pressure volume loops. Here on the left, you can see the typical pressure volume loops of a ventricle, okay? On this axis, axis you have the volume, on this you have the pressure. And typically, uh, people start with, from this point, okay? Uh, so we, the, the heart is filled by blood, then it starts to contract. So the pressure increases because there is an active force that is contracting. Then the valve opens, so we have the ejection phase, the volume decreases, okay? Then the valve closes, so we have a isovolumetric relaxation, so the volume becomes is constant, is constant and the pressure decreases because the tissue is relaxing. And finally, we have the filling phase. Instead, the, um, the pressure volume loops of ether are more complex because they have this uh, uh, very characteristic uh, uh, shape of, of eight, okay? And a goal of mathematical model is to be able to replicate uh, this phenomenon. So now uh, that I gave you a very brief introduction of how the heart is made and how it works, uh, we can talk finally uh, about mathematical models. So mathematical model is a description of a physical phenomenon in terms of uh, equations, okay, of uh, mathematical equation that describe that phenomenon. So what do we need to construct a mathematical model of the heart? First of all, we need uh, to characterize it geometrically. So we need to define a computational domain. So a set, a subset of the Euclidean space that represents the heart. And this is typically done by subdividing the heart in different compartments. So in this picture, for instance, you, you had the ventricles, and violet, then you had the atria, and then you had the two outflow tracts, the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. And then you also have different uh, uh, regions that, that describe the cardiac valves. And it is very important to split the domain in different sub, sub regions because each of them are characterized by different features. So the model will have some parameters and the parameters will be different in these different uh, regions. But how do we construct uh, this kind of, uh, of geometry? To do that, we typically start by medical imaging. So images that are acquired in the clinical routine. You might be familiar with the terms CT uh, scans, uh, computerized tomography, MRI, so uh, magnetic resonance imaging, LG is the late gadolinium MRI and phase constant MRI. And different uh, imaging techniques uh, are suitable, are appropriate for different kinds of informations that you want to extract. For instance, for the extraction of the geometry of the heart and of the coronaries, the best way to go is uh, the uh, CT scans. So now that we have extracted the geometry, we need to compute, uh, to construct what we call the computational mesh. A mesh is a subdivision of the uh, domain into very small elements, like the ones that you can see in these pictures, that are used uh, to solve uh, the mathematical model using uh, a computer. And to do that, uh, there are some um, uh, specialized tools uh, uh, we are using the tools developed by our colleague Marco Fedele that uh, foresees several uh, steps. So first we start from the uh, processing of, of the surface, then we identify the boundaries, then we generate uh, this uh, mesh on the surface, and then we propagate the mesh uh, within a volume. So in the end, we have a mesh that is subdivided into subregions. Then another ingredient that we need to construct our a mathematical model 
is the orientation of cardiac fibers. So as you might know, as you may know, the uh, cardiac muscle uh, is uh, made of muscle fibers that are uh, um, some preferential directions that involve both the, the propagation of the electrical signal and also the generation of active force because the for generated force will follow the, 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 the fiber. And the fibers in the heart uh, have a very special structure. They have this sort of helicoidal structure with uh, an orientation that changes between the internal and external region. And having a suitable description of this structure is fundamental to replicate the correct behavior of the heart. Because if you don't have this change of orientation, that will not have the correct twisting that is fundamental for squeezing the blood out of the cardiac chambers. Now we can finally pass to equations. I will try to be as lightweight as possible with the equation, but this is just to give you an idea of the mathematical tools that are, are used to uh, describe uh, this model of, of, of the R. So first of all, we have this model. It is the model of ions that describes how these uh, chemical species uh, moves uh, inside and outside the cardiac cells. And these equations are typically written in this form. So this is the partial derivative in time. So this describes how these uh, uh, variables uh, change in time. Okay? And here the state variables uh, are these vectors that describe how this uh, um, uh, cell uh, um, um, channels are open or closed and the concentration of the different chemical species. So this is what we call ordinary differential equations. They are called like this because we have uh, only the derivative with respect to one variable this time. And the typical solution is the one that you can see here in the right. So the black line is the transmembrane potential. It is the potential difference between the inner and the outer part of, of, of the cells. And we have the, at the beginning of the uh, uh, heart beating, what we call the depolarization. So the transmembrane potential very quickly increases. And then we have the, depolar the depolarization that follows a plateau. And in the meanwhile, all the, all the ions concentration changing, change, among which calcium, which is very important because this is the trigger of the contraction, that is the red line. Then we have models that describe the propagation of this electrical signal. So uh, the, the trigger that is uh, an electrical signal propagates uh, in, uh, in the, the, the whole heart. And this is described by instead a partial differential equations. So partial differential equations are a class of equations that involve the derivative not only with respect to time, but also with respect to other variables. So in this case, with respect to to, to space. So if you are familiar with this kind of equation, here we had the divergence of a gradient that is a Laplacian, that is an equation that describes the diffusion of this, uh, of this variable. Here the variables are the transmembrane potential and the extracellular potential. And the typical solution is the one that you can see in this picture. Here you can see the propagation of the electrical potential in a, a full heart model. As you see, the the trigger is uh, in the atria. So now the movement is going to start again. So the, here you can see in the upper part of the atria, the signal propagates, then it reaches the atrioventricular node that acts as a gate between atria and ventricles, and then it propagates also across uh, the ventricles. Uh, the model that I showed before is called the bi-domain model, but this is not the only mathematical model to describe this phenomenon. And this is very common in mathematical modeling. You never have a single model to describe a given phenomenon, but you always have uh, several models. Uh, and depending on uh, the situation, one model is better than the other. So there is no one model that is uh, the best one, but depending on the case, depending on what we're interested in, there are different models. For instance, this model is called the Aconal model. This is a simplification of the bi-domain model because it does not describe the transmembrane potential in all the, all the points and all the time instants, but it just gives you 
the time of activation. It is the time where the signal reaches a single point. Uh, of course, this contains uh, less information, or in some sense, uh, it is uh, less completed by the main model, but it is much cheaper from a computational viewpoint. For instance, if the binomial model can take several hours to be solved, the conal model can, can take just a few seconds. So for this reason, in some situations, the econal model is more convenient than the binomial model. Then the next step is to describe the generation of active force. Because as we mentioned, the heart is a muscle. So its functioning is based on the ability of cardiac cells to generate a force. And uh, to do that, uh, we have developed uh, an innovative model. Uh, this was the topic of my PhD thesis. That was uh, the first model in the literature that was able to capture all the uh, most important uh, experimental observation, the mechanism of force generation, still in a computationally tractable uh, manner. So we are, uh, in this model, we are including the dependence uh, on the elongation of fibers. Uh, that is uh, the microscopic basis of uh, uh, Microsoft microscopic regulation phenomenon that is called the frank stalin mechanism. And later we will go back on this. And then we also included the dependence on the uh, shortening velocity of fibers. This kind of dependence is uh, very often neglecting it in models, but we have proved that including this dependence is crucial for the reproduction of uh, very important phenomena su such as the regulation of the contraction speed. Then another uh, ingredient that we need uh, in our model is to describe the passive behavior of the myocardium, of the cardiac muscle. By passive behavior, I mean the uh, constitutive uh, behavior of the, uh, of the muscle as an elastic body. So, all the elastic bodies that are around us have its proper constitutive law. And also the constitutive law of the heart has been characterized. And also this is a partial differential equations. And this derives from the balance of momentum. So the Newton second law that, that I guess you are familiar with. So mass times acceleration equal force. And this can be recognized here in this equation. So this is the density. So this is related to the mass. It is the mass per unit volume. Here we have the secondary of the displacement that is the acceleration. And here we have the force. So this is the divergence of the stress tensor. That is basically the force that acts at the microscopic way. And then to close the model, we need what are called the boundary conditions. So in other terms, the equations that uh, we mentioned before, describe the behavior of the heart inside the domain. But then we have boundaries, and we also have to prescribe some conditions to characterize the behavior of the tissue at the boundaries. And mm, despite the name, uh, boundary conditions are not marginal, but they're very important. And some sometimes they are uh, neglected, but uh, their role is really important for uh, a physiological uh, solution. Uh, and we apply different boundary conditions in different parts of, of, of the domain. For instance, on the pericardium, that is the outer region of the heart, we impose boundary conditions that account for the interaction with uh, what, what is outside. So we apply some boundary conditions that account for the elastic interaction with the surrounding environment. Then, uh, we have the, the base of the ventricle, that is an artificial boundary, okay? And we, de we derived a new uh, um, expression for the boundary condition that we call the energy consistent boundary conditions that have several advantages with respect to uh, boundary condition used before, and it allows us to, uh, uh, to obtain a very uh, physiological meaning behavior. Instead, in the inner part of the, of the heart that is in contact of, of, of the fluid, we account for the interaction between the solid and, and, and the fluid. And the Caprion condition depends on the way how we describe the, um, the fluid. Okay, 
So now we can finally pass to the description, the description of the fluid, because even if we are just describing uh, the heart, uh, we cannot neglect uh, its interaction with uh, the blood, okay? Because the blood de determines the pressure that acts inside um, the, uh, the, the cardiac chambers. And to do that, we are using a model, a lamp parameters model, so a very simplified model of the whole circulation. It's called the closed loop model because it accounts for all the, the, the circulation. And this model is, de is derived with an, an analogy with an electric circuit. Um, in particular, uh, there is an, a formal analogy between electric current and blood fluxes and between electric potential and the pressure of blood. And this is, I think, a fascinating aspect of mathematics that you have two different physical phenomena that apparently are really different one from the other, but that formally can be described in the same way. And so mathematics allows you to uh, reuse the equations, the tools, the software that you have developed to describe one phenomenon to describe also the other one. And this model allows for a modular coupling with our three-dimensional model. Because inside this model, you have a description, for instance, of the left ventricle, that is this one, but you can plug instead of this simplified description, your three-dimensional de description and obtain a three-dimensional model coupled with this simplified model of circulation. So to sum up uh, all the different models that we have uh, uh, mentioned, so we had, first of all, a model described the ionic activity, so the fluxes of ions, then a model that described the electrical activity, so the propagation of the electrical potential, and we had the generation of active force, okay? Then we had the passive mechanics of, uh, of, of the myocardium, and finally, the circulation model. So these are different models that are all coupled together because there are quantities that couple the different models. And in this way, we obtain what we call a multi-physics model because a model that includes several physics. Indeed, we have biochemistry, we have uh, electricity, we have uh, uh, mechanics, we have fluid dynamics, all uh, coupled together to uh, fulfill uh, the cardiac function. And on the right, you can see instead of a sketch of the uh, mathematical model of the four chambers uh, heart uh, coupled with external circulation. As you can see, we have this three-dimensional description of the heart and then this lamp parameter description of the external circulation. So we have the pulmonary circulation and here on the bottom, the uh, systemic circulation. And the three-dimensional model of the heart is split into subregions. And in all the different subregions, sub different models are used. For instance, before we mentioned the ionic models, okay? And we use uh, two different ionic models for the atria and for the ventricles. And the reason is that even if we have uh, similar cells uh, in the different part of the heart, uh, they are, however, different. For instance, the cells of the atria have some characteristic time that are different than those of the ventricles. And, don't, and, and therefore, different models have been developed. And so we are using different models in the different subregions of, of the heart. Then we have also models for the cardiac valves that are described uh, with an analogy with the electrical diodes because they allow the flow just in one direction. And in this way, we have concluded the description of the mathematical model. But then uh, we need what uh, uh, we call the uh, numerical approximation. Uh, what do we need by num numerical approximation? Uh, so, uh, so far we have uh, defined a model, okay, that we can call the exact model, then I will explain you why, that has an exact solution. The problem is that in many situations, it's not possible to derive the exact solution from the exact model. The reason is that the equations that I showed you before 
are so complex, so uh, difficult that cannot be solved by a human, okay? That are not like mm, equations that you can solve by paper and pencil, okay? Sometimes they do not even admit an analytical solution. And so instead of passing from the exact model to the exact solution, people came up with the idea of the numerical approximation. The idea is to de define a new model that is different from the one that they want to solve, that is the numerical model. The numerical model is an approximation of the exact model. This is a different model, okay? But it has the advantage that it can be solved and it can give you the solution of the numerical model that will be an approximate solution. And so the solution will be an approximation of the exact solution. So instead of going from the exact model to the exact solution, we, derive, we define a numerical model, we define its solution, we'll, which will be an approximation of the exact solution. Why is it called numerical? It is called numerical because it will be uh, solved by computer. So numerical recalls a digital, okay? So a numerical model is a model that can be solved by specialized algorithms, typically on supercomputers. And so it can provide an approximation of the exact solution. Uh, so now I will give you some uh, sketches of how we construct uh, this uh, numerical approximation. So the basic idea is that of discretization. So we pass from a continuous model from a discrete one. Why? Well, because computers are only able to work with the discrete objects, okay? So the first step is to discretize the space. So the space is divided in uh, a very small elements, uh, typically hexahedra or tetrahedra. Before I showed you a mesh, a mesh is made of all these elements and use the, what we call the finite element method. That is a discretization method that is, is based on, on the approximation of the continuous function on these elements. Then we need to compute uh, many integrals because the finite element method uh, foresees the, uh, uh, the definition of integrals on all these elements. And to compute them, we use uh, the so-called quadrature formulas that are uh, specialized algorithms that are used to approximate integrals by a finite sum of evaluations of the integral. And we also discretize the time. So we split the continuous time in uh, several sub-steps. And then we use uh, suitable algorithms to advance in time from one time step to the other one. So, this was for the approximation of the single model, but as we mentioned before, we have uh, several models that are coupled together because we have a multi-physics model. And so we have to make all these models to communicate each other. And to do that, we use uh, uh, the integrity transfer operators that allows to pass the information from uh, one model to the other. But how to couple this model? There are several approaches that I give you an idea of the different approaches. One is the monolithic one. That is, we solve all the models as a unique monolithic system. Another approach is a partition strategy in which we solve first one model, then the other. Then we go back to the first model and then we solve the other. And we subiterate until we reach convergence. Or we can use a segregated approaches. Segregated approaches when you solve a model and then you pass to the next one and you, and you proceed in time. So you do not sub, sub iterate. Or we can use a staggered approach in which we solve several sub steps for a single model. And this is very useful when a, a model has a, a characteristic time that is much faster than another one. Um, the, these approaches are more attractive, but they can give you some instability. So some oscillation that are artificial that came up. And so we had to define suitable uh, methods to prevent these uh, uh, oscillations that are called numerical oscillations. In the end, you end up with uh, a discrete system that a computer is in principle able to solve, but we have to define algorithms also for that. So first of all, we need to switch from a nonlinear system of equation to a linear one. And you use linearization techniques such as the Newton method that you might be familiar with. 
Then we end up with a linear system. So in the end of the day, you always end up with a linear system, but which is typically very big. We are talking about millions of unknowns typically. And so we use a typically iterative solvers and we also need to precondition. And so we also need preconditions. So this was to give you an idea of the kind of algorithms that are behind the numerical solution. And just think that whenever we need to solve a model, we have to go through all the methods, all the ingredients that I mentioned before, and to find a suitable choice for uh, the model. So finally, I can present you the numerical model uh, of our heart that is represented here. So in the left, you, you, you can see the computational mesh. So we can see a slice of the four chambers subdividing in a very huge number of, uh, of tetraeda. Just think that we have more than one million of tetraeda. And so uh, in all the tetrahedron, all the variables that I mentioned before, so the terminal potential, the ions concentration, the state of the contracted uh, proteins, the displacement, the pressure, all these variables are defined in all these cells, okay? And then you also have time discretizations. So we subdivide the duration of the heartbeat in very small time steps. For instance, we are talking about 50 microseconds for the electrophysiological variables. So if you multiply the number of time steps by the number of equations of unknowns that you have for each time step, you have almost one trillion of unknowns. So a really gigantic number. And indeed, these kind of models cannot be approximated on a standard laptop. You need the specialized hardware facilities. So we talk about high performance computing. For instance, the simulations that I'm going to, to show you has been run on a, a, the a Galileo uh, supercomputer. It is the largest supercomputer that we have in Italy. And it has been run over more than 1,000 cores. So uh, like uh, 1,000 single computers working together to solve uh, a single mathematical problem. And the simulation of a single heartbeat on this uh, really impressive computational platform took four hours. So just think of how complex these kind of computations are. So now finally that I hope I gave you an idea of what is behind the construction uh, of these uh, numerical simulations, I will show you some numerical results. So this is the uh, contraction of the heart. So this is a solution of the multi-physics and multi-scale problem that I mentioned before. You can see here the contraction of the cardiac chambers. On the right, you can see a slice. Uh, you can see that first uh, the atrial contracts because of the fact that uh, electrophysiology involves the atria before then the ventricles, and then also the ventricle contracts. And so you, you can see this uh, uh, typical movement of the heart where which we have the basal plane that goes upward and downward, okay? And the color corresponds to the uh, active force that is generating. So red and black means uh, large development of force, uh, blue means uh, small force, okay? So this picture shows you in each time and in each point, which is the value of the active force during the contraction. Uh, then given a simulation like this, we can also ext extract some uh, pictures, some uh, graphics that are useful to clinicians. So for instance, this is the pressure volume loops that I mentioned before. This is not a painting. This is the result of, uh, of, uh, the, of the simulation. And uh, uh, we are very proud of this result because uh, uh, we were the the, the, the first one that were able to reproduce pressure volume loops with a, a biophysical fidelity uh, like the one that you can see in this slide, did there are a lot of features that are uh, very known by clinicians that we were able to, to reproduce. For instance, the, uh, the, the mutual position of, uh, of, of the peak, the characteristic shape, the relative areas be between these two loops and so on and so forth. You can see different view of the same thing. And we also com uh, compared the results uh, that we obtained with our model with reference values for the ideal patients. And we obtain a, a really, really good uh, uh, result. In the slide, you can see the time uh, evolution of pressures of volumes 
uh, of uh, uh, fluxes across vault. Okay, and also in this case we capture the uh, very physiological values of, for all these quantities. So this was a validation of the fact that uh, our model is, uh, rep is uh, reproducing with a very good fidelity the physiology of a, a, of a human heart. And then we also try to, to use our model to uh, investigate the relationship between some microscopic uh, phenomenon and uh, uh, what happens at the microscopic scale. This is something that you can do with uh, a mathematical model. You can investigate the relationship with what happens at the scale of nanometers with what happens to the scale of uh, centimeters. And we found out very interesting things. For instance, we found out that the cooperativity of the generation of force, that is the interactions between uh, proteins uh, that happens uh, inside cells uh, as a consequence uh, at, on, for the function of the whole heart because it, it uh, ensures a very large development of force compared to, uh, to the force that you have in diastole. Then we also investigated the length dependent activation that has an impact, as I was mentioning, the so called Frank Starling effect, by which the larger is the volume at the beginning of systole, the larger will be the development of force. And this is a self regulation phenomenon of the heart that is crucial for its current behavior. Indeed, when you start to do physical activity, for instance, if you start climbing the, the stairs, then more blood reaches your, your heart. And then the heart has to generate a larger force. And this is not something that you have to, to, to choose with your brain. It's not an external input to the heart, but it is, it is a self-regulation phenomenon of the heart. And this can be validated through a mathematical model. And finally, the third ingredient, that the third element I want to discuss is the force velocity relationship. It is the a relationship between the shortening velocity of fibers and the generated force. And this is much less studied in the literature. This is, was not very studied as far as, as we know. And we proved that with our model, it has, it has a, a, a role in the, uh, in, the, the, in, the uh, con, in, in, in the regulation of the contraction velocity. Indeed, we made this, uh, this test. We uh, took our model and we generated a, a synthetic heart without this force velocity um, uh, relationship. And we show that without this kind of regulation inside cells, we have fluxes across the valves that are not physiological. So we have shown that one possible uh, explanation of this phenomenon from the evolutionary viewpoint is that of regulating the, the fluxes across the valves. And then we can also go beyond instead of just uh, modeling and simulating the electromechanical function of the heart, we can also simulate the fluid dynamics of the heart. So I will be quick on this part. I will not show other mathematical equations. I just mentioned that uh, the equations for this phenomenon are called the Navier-Stokes equation. They are very famous set of partial differential equations. And this simulation is done by imposing the movement of the, of the heart computed with the previous model to a fluid dynamics model. But we can also do more. We can do fluid structure interaction. So we can actually simulate the interaction between the fluid and, and, uh, and the solid. This is a very challenging type of, of simulation. It is also very computationally costly. It is just an idea of the kind of results that, that you can get. Here we are simulating both the contraction of the myocardium and the fluid dynamics uh, inside, uh, um, in this case, the left atrium and ventricle. Uh, just a few words on software, because uh, software plays a really a pivotal role in mathematical modeling, because when you want to uh, perform this kind of numerical simulations that are very computation demanding, you have to perform an ad hoc uh, um, development of software. And the software that we are using is called LifeX, it's a software that we developed inside our group, starting from a library that is called Deal two, and mm, we are uh, partially releasing uh, this code as an open source. So if you're interested, you can browse this website and you can find some parts of the code that are uh, released for deductive or uh, research purposes. And 
just one slide on uh, tests that we do on, 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 on the software. Uh, the software is a parallel one. This is able to be run on many computational cores simultaneously. And one test that is typically done is that of speed up. So we test that if we increase the number of cores, then uh, the time uh, taken by the software to run uh, decreases. And here we tested that our software uh, scales very well uh, up to thousands of cores. Okay, uh, now uh, I would like also to spend some words uh, on how machine learning can help to uh, even uh, reach better performances for uh, mathematical modeling, in particular for the human heart. This is a line of research that we have uh, recently uh, started to follow within our group, but, and we already reached uh, uh, some uh, uh, results. So just to give you some um, a, a, a perspective of my viewpoint, so I think that there are two words. One is that of physics-based modeling that is based on uh, the idea of causality. So we start from physics principles with the right mathematical model and, and we find results. That is a framework that I'm, I show you so far. And on the other hand, we have machine learning that instead based on the idea of, of correlation. Okay, on trying to start from data to infer uh, relationships. And I think that these two words sir, are not in contraposition one to the other, but they are somehow complementary and we can reach what we call the data model fusion. For instance, physics-based modeling can help machine learning, for instance, for regularization, for data augmentation, and instead machine learning can help physics-based modeling for model order reduction to uncover constitutive laws, or for tasks such as parameter estimation, sensitivity analysis of uncertainty quantification. And here I collected a list of tools that are, uh, belongs to one word to the other or to the interface of the two of them. And I'll try now to give you some examples of possibility of reaching data models fusion. One is that of learning a model for four generation. So this is something that we did because we have a four generation model that was very detailed, but it costed too much to be used in a multi-scale set. So what we did was to start from a model like this, a generated database of simulations, and then to learn a, a reduced model that is a time-dependent neural network by using a new method that we developed that is called the model learning. It's a method that is capable of learning a differential equation starting from uh, a time transients. And once this reduced model is built, it can be used as a replacement of the original one within a, a, a finite element setting. This is what we did. This is the neural network that we trained. So basically, it is able to replicate the outputs of the original model with a very good fidelity, as you can see in, in the bottom line. And we can this can be used as a replacement of the uh, original model by reaching an impressive speed up. Indeed, the computational time is decreased by 400 times. And overall, by considering all the models, we decrease the computational time by one order of magnitude. And we also reduce a lot the memory fingerprint of our software because it's reduced by uh, two orders of magnitude with uh, an accuracy that is very good. Indeed, what we have to pay for this approximation is uh, uh, an error of one part over uh, 1,000 or more. Then another way of uh, mixing uh, machine learning and uh, mathematical modeling is uh, the following. Uh, it's somehow similar to before, but here we do not want to surrogate a model of the cell, but of the whole heart. Here the fact is that the computational cost of this uh, multi-scale model, as I mentioned before, is really prohibitive, it's very large. So in situations where you want to do many, many simulations, such as when you want to calibrate the parameters, so you have to do trial and error, then it is prohibited. So we came up with the idea of surrogating the computational expensive part, that is the three-dimensional model with what we call an emulator. So a very simplified model that basically accounts for the time-dependent pressure volume relationship defined by the three-dimensional model, but can still be used to uh, 
um, predict the result of the three-dimensional model, and is still coupled with the circulation model. So in this way, we, we can perform what we call a V-cycle. So we start from a three-dimensional simulation. We perform a few cycles. From these, we train, we construct this very simplified emulator. And then with the emulator, we calibrate the parameters of the circulation model, and we reach a limit cycle that is a periodic solution. And then we use these parameters in the initial state to run a simulation with uh, going back to the, uh, the three-dimensional model. So this is why we call it a V-cycle, OK? And this allowed us to speed up uh, by orders of magnitude the, the process of calibration. And another uh, project that we carried out is, uh, um, is similar to the one before, but in this case, we also wanted to account for the variability of the uh, model of the three-dimensional model, because the first one is tailored for a given patient, for a given set of parameters. Instead, we wanted also to account for a variability of the uh, of the three-dimensional model. And so we use the more advanced techniques. So the idea was the following. We sample a parameter space. So we take some random values of the parameter. We run a simulation. And we collect a huge number of simulations in, in a database. And then by using model learning again, that is the method that I mentioned before, you can find more information in this paper, we train a reduced model based on neural networks that surrogate the three-dimensional model. And this allowed us to obtain very good results. The dashed line is the result of the surrogate model, and the solid one is the one the original one. You can see that they are almost indistinguishable. The, the matching is very, very good, and the speed up is impressive. So with the uh, original model on a supercomputer, we did four hours to perform a simulation on one heartbeat. Instead, with this standard, uh, with this uh, uh, reduced model based on neural network, we can do simulations in real time. So one second of simulation on a standard laptop. So we have a speed up that is of several orders of magnitude. And we used it to perform, for instance, what is called sensitivity analysis. That is a technique that is used to answer the question, which parameter affects which output? So we have some parameters, typically many of them, you don't know which are important to determine some specific quantities of interest. And sensitivity analysis answers these questions. And this is typically done by performing a huge number of simulations and then computing some statistics. But this takes really a lot by using the original model. This will take years, decades to get the results. Instead, with our approach, we perform just a few simulations with the original model. Then we use them to train a reduced model. And then we use the reduced model to compute the, um, the, the sensitivity analysis indexes, so these this, this, this statistics. And this, accounting also for the time needed to generate the data to train the model, allows us to get results in nearly one week of simulations. Okay, So instead of 78 years, just one week. So this was the results, just to give you an idea. Uh, on the rows, you, you can see that all the parameters of our model or just a subset of them. And on the columns, you can see some quantities of interest. For instance, minimum maximum pressures, minimum maximum volumes, the difference of volumes, so some quantities that are useful for clinicians. And the colors uh, tells you the information how the parameter is impactful for that output. And this information is very useful for clinicians because uh, they know what affects what. OK, so uh, to conclude, uh, I'd like to show you some applications of uh, uh, all this stuff, because you may wonder, what is this worth for? So some clinical applications that we are carrying out in collaboration with clinical partners. So this is an overview of the diseases that we are treating. So this is of uh, uh, coronaries, of bulbs, uh, aortic aneurysms arrhythmias, cardiomyopathies, heart failure, and also uh, we also studied the effects of COVID-19 on the cardiac function. So I will give you just uh, three examples, okay? The first one is about uh, um, arrhythmias, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, 
can be split between ventricular tachycardia and atrial fibrillations. And both of them are related to a, a non-organized uh, uh, propagation of the electrical potential. So you can see this simulation is very different than one that we have seen, be seen before. So before we had a very regular propagation, here we have an irregular one. This is due to the presence typically of scars, so imperfections of the cardiac tissue or the cardiac substrates that generate a re-entry. So uh, the, 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 the wave front goes back and starts to circulate across uh, these uh, obstacles. And these phenomena uh, are uh, um, uh, very um, uh, dangerous uh, for people and then can even lead to, to death, in particular ventricular tachycardia. And the typical uh, treatment is that of ablation. So uh, the surgeon uh, makes some uh, damage to some further damage to the substrate that is able to block the formation of reentries. However, the targets of ablation is fully tailored to, to, to the patient. And uh, typically the surgeons does not have a, a very clear indication where to ablate, okay? And this is how mathematical modeling can help. Indeed, uh, starting from uh, uh, imaging taken from, uh, from, from the patient, simulations can help uh, in uh, simulating uh, the possible outcome of different ablation strategies. So it can give uh, to the clinicians some indication on which could be the optimal location of ablation or not. Okay. This, of course, must be, must be mixed with the experience of the, of the clinicians, okay, because we cannot uh, stay without their experience, but it can be a useful way to give an indication, a guidance to the clinicians. Uh, uh, similar to, to this uh, is the uh, virtual heart arrhythmia risk predictor, the BART protocol that was developed uh, in the John Hopkins University, in a group of Professor Tranova, with which we are uh, collaborating. In particular, we are collaborating with them for an extension of this protocol to account also for the deformation of the heart. Because this protocol accounts for a heart that is fixed, that is not moving. Instead, we are studying which are the effects of the motion of the heart in this kind of phenomenon, in this uh, uh, ventricular uh, tachycardia. And we have shown that indeed the motion of the heart can, uh, can be able to stop or even to trigger a vent ventricular uh, tachycardia. So it is crucial to account also for this. Um, another example of clinical uh, application is this project that we are carrying out with another hospital in Italy uh, that is about uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy. It is a treatment that you need when uh, your heart uh, has, doesn't have uh, the proper synchronization between, uh, uh, between uh, the two ventricles. And the treatment consists in the implantation of the device in the heart that uh, acts as an artificial pacemaker, giving a trigger in the right place in the right moment. But the problem is to define which is the right place and which is the right moment. And at the moment, there are some general guidance that are not very, very tailored to a given patient. So we are using simulation to simulate different scenarios of different pacing locations and different pacing times. We compute some indicators such as the pressure volume loops. And based on this uh, indication, we find the location and time that is most promising for a given patient to restore as, as better as possible its uh, uh, cardiac function. Uh, finally, another project is about the septal myectomy, that is a treatment to, uh, to uh, treat uh, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that is a pathology by which the, the septum uh, grows in an abnormal way, and it becomes an obstacle for the flow uh, of blood. So the treatment is a uh, a surgical one, it, is, it consists in the removal of uh, the septum. The question is how much and where to remove uh, the septum. And so we are using simulations to uh, simulate indeed uh, with a mathematical model, 
the outcome of different uh, uh, um, um, ways of, of, of proceeding and to suggesting the optimal region for the treatment. Uh, so in, in, in summary, the uh, iHeart model can be useful for four different uh, applications. The first one is that of uh, basic research, so understanding the, the, the cardiac function, that it can be used to study new therapies. And then on a patient-specific way to perform diagnostic or even to guide the treatment. So uh, just let me uh, acknowledge all my co-workers. This is the iHeart team. So all the results that you've seen is, uh, so would not have been possible without the, uh, the, the joint work of uh, all these people that I want to, to, to thank. And uh, uh, now I thank you very much uh, for, for your attention. And also again, for the opportunity of uh, presenting the, this work now. And if you're interested, uh, feel free to, to, to send me an email or uh, you can, uh, go through uh, this uh, uh, publication or the other publication uh, you have seen uh, in the, in the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francesco. I think uh, this was an amazing talk where you relate uh, all the necessary uh, tools needed uh, for uh, clinicians on one hand uh, from the mathematical side and uh, what is the importance of modeling and uh, this uh, synergy between uh, computational models and, uh, and machine learning. Uh, I think it's time for questions. So please, if you have any questions, you can raise the hand and unmute yourself to ask the question or uh, you can type in the chat box. I have a question, Fatima. Okay, please go ahead, Professor Tuma. First, I want to uh, thank you for a truly wonderful uh, presentation. First, for the effort you have put in making a very, very complex uh, problem uh, accessible to a wide audience and meticulously going through all the steps. Truly remarkable. And I am sure uh, to uh, revisit your talk again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I come to the subject from uh, dynamical system theory where our dream was in the 80s to try to think of center manifold descriptions of hard dynamics, i.e. finite dimensional descriptions of infinite dimensional uh, physics. Uh, I wonder what uh, the simulations you have done uh, lead us to conclude when it comes to this program. In some sense, uh, you uh, developed extremely uh, complex and numerically costly uh, models with uh, a very, very large number of degrees of freedom. And then you proceeded to uh, work uh, through uh, machine learning to recover uh, uh, somewhat truncated models with which to make fast progress on exploring scenarios, perhaps with a view to feeding uh, the detailed simulations once you have a better idea of what's going on. Uh, do you believe that ultimately this complex dynamical system that you uh, developed probably over decades of work uh, ultimately reduces to such finite dimensional descriptions? Yeah, so it's a very um, good question. Um, so uh, we strongly believe that this very high dimensional system is intrinsically low dimensional. So there, there is for, so uh, almost surely the dynamics uh, indeed takes place uh, on a lower dimensional manifold than all these uh, millions of uh, degrees of freedom. And indeed we obtained very good re results with these uh, reduction approaches uh, that was really, uh, drastic uh, because we reduced uh, these millions of degrees of freedom in just a few uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, but uh, this on all only works uh, uh, in uh, very limited uh, working regimes. So just uh, for instance, when you have uh, a physiological behavior, 
they do not work when you have a pathological one. So before we mention the cardiac electrophysiology, okay? So the physiological behavior is very regular, okay, is very, very, very smooth, while the pathological one instead has a very chaotic behavior. So probably this reduction is feasible in the physiological one. So when the heart works as it is designed to work, okay? But if you want to capture, to describe, uh, and to predict the pathological behavior, then uh, reduction is not uh, uh, feasible uh, anymore. And also, I will also mention that the reduced model that I showed are uh, tailored to a specific geometry. So we take given geometry and we derive the reduced model. If you take a new geometry, then the training is to be done from scratch. Okay, so we are not still reducing with respect to, ge to the geometrical variability, which uh, will be in um, our another task. So probably, if we would consider also the geometric variability, then the uh, increasing dimension would not be that small, but would be much much larger. Indeed, that's a very important point. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, I have one more question, if I may, uh, Fatima, and then I'll leave the floor to others, maybe ask uh, other questions later. When you were simulating arrhythmias, uh, how did you proceed with initiating your uh, experiments? So what were you relying on? Was it clinical data? Was it models of uh, these uh, irregularities? How were you stimulating them? Well, um, so uh, first of all, uh, uh, when we treat a new patient, uh, we have to personalize the model on that patient. So we personalize it uh, geometrically. So we start from the geometry of, the, of that patient. Uh, then we use uh, cardiac imaging, in particular LGMRI, to uh, characterize uh, the presence of, uh, of, of, uh, of scars, okay? Like, uh, um, uh, so for instance, in, in, in this picture, you can see the, um, the, 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 the yellow region, okay, here that corresponds to the presence of scars. So it, uh, this is crucial to uh, char characterize uh, a, a, given, uh, a given patient. Then we do some hypothesis to describe uh, the different uh, behavior or cardiac cells in the scar region and in the healthy region, and also in the gray zone, which is the boundary between uh, between the, 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 the two. So there are, we, uh, we use uh, literature uh, values uh, on the impact of the scar on uh, the cell behavior. For instance, we know that uh, some ionic channels are included in the, in the scar regions. And so this allows us to characterize the substrate in that region. And then we, when we run the simulation, we need to initialize it properly. So there is a protocol that uh, um, foresees a, a, a sequence of impulses uh, given at a specific time instance that uh, uh, are aimed to replicate what uh, clinicians do, uh, when do when they do it physically. So they physically perform this protocol to see whether it is possible or not that an arrhythmia is induced. And we do the same, but we do it synthetically. Quite elaborate. Thank you very much for the explanations. I uh, leave the floor to others. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Any questions from the audience? Fatima, if I may, I've raised my hand, but I don't know if you've seen it. Thank you so, thank you so much for the beautiful presentation with really uh, very impressive visuals. Um, I also have a follow-up question on what you had asked on uh, reduced models. Um, you mentioned the chaotic behavior, and we know that for uh, some chaotic systems, uh, you can really write down uh, dynamics of, uh, let's say, few modes uh, and consider uh, chaos as an intermittent uh, 
addition to the uh, reduced order dynamics. Was this ever explored? Um, no, um, we did not try to do that. Um, um, actually, uh, it is, uh, so this will be tailored to a given patient because uh, the geometry of each patient in, is, uh, um, is different from uh, uh, each other. Um, so uh, it, it would be interesting to um, to try to, to to see whether even if in the chaotic uh, case uh, and there are just uh, a few modes uh, involved in uh, the in uh, the simulation, um, what would be would be really uh, useful would be to have some tool that can. Uh, predict the outcome uh, for a generic patient. So this is, I think, really the challenge here uh, will be the possibility of uh, having something that does not need uh, some pre-processing for any new patient, because this will really give something that can be used online in the clinical practice. Clinical practice. I don't know if I, I I'm, I'm I'm sure that I did not answer your question, but I hope. No, uh, no, no, absolutely. It was it's pretty much straight to the point. Thank you so much. Well, uh, if nobody has questions, I I will allow myself to ask one more question. Uh, what about uh, recent models that include stochastic effects, like in the noise that may be due to. Uh, uh, the ionic flows or something like that uh, would it make the problem more complicated how uh, how the the simulations will uh, will become in that case yeah uh, so we have never um, included these uh, kind of elements and this I think would uh, increase uh, dramatically the computational cost uh, so probably this will not be feasible at, at present uh, with this kind of model. Uh, we are considering uh, stochasticity in the active four generation model because uh, it is a model that describes uh, what happens at the scale of mic micrometers or even less uh, or uh, tens of nanometers actually. And that scale thermal fluctuations uh, play a very important role so we cannot neglect uh, sto stochasticity and we worked a lot uh, to derive uh, uh, equations to um, be able to simulate this kind of model so without the need of using uh, monte carlo method which is uh, com uh, too much costly from the computational viewpoint so we use the stochastic calculus uh, to uh, transform uh, these uh, stochastic uh, differential equations into uh, PDEs uh, first and later ODEs. So in the end, uh, we can uh, solve these stochastic system by using ODEs. Mm -hmm. uh, this is feasible uh, because the, 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 the model is intrinsically related to a single cell. Instead, uh, including uh, sto stochasticity into electrophysiology that is intrinsically three-dimensional, um, um, I think it would, it would be much more challenging. Well, uh, I don't see any questions again from the audience. Uh, if, if someone would like to ask. Uh... Um, I have one question, it's more technical. Okay. Uh, concerning the AI part, what were you using exactly? An already made algorithm, just applying it, or you wrote your own algorithms? Or uh, yeah, so we, we are, uh, are writing our own algorithms. Indeed, um, in particular, um, we developed uh, this method that is called uh, uh, model learning. 
uh, it has been proposed uh, in into into this paper of uh, of JCP. Uh, basically, this algorithm uh, takes uh, a collection of uh, uh, input output uh, uh, fun transients. Okay, so time transients of input and the corresponding output, uh, and it tries to infer a law that generated uh, these uh, uh, this time dependent behavior. Um, um, we also have a freely available MATLAB uh, um, implementation. If you're interested, you can go to this paper and you can find the link or you can drop me an email. And uh, this is at the, at, at the basis, uh, both uh, of these uh, results and also of the results uh, of these other uh, um, tool. Uh, th this is also made based on, on, on the same results. Then we are also doing something uh, on a physics informed neural network that I didn't mention here. And also for that, we are using some uh, uh, internal codes. And finally, concerning uh, this other uh, tool, uh, we call the uh, uh, cardiac uh, and, 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 and emulator. Uh, also for this, we wrote our code. And also this is uh, it, it's available. If you go to, to, to this paper, you, you can also find the, the Python code for, for this. So they are all Python codes mainly. Or uh, some, some, also some MATLAB code as well. Okay, thank you. Interesting talk. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I, I have one more question, if, if you allow me. Uh, just regarding the oscillations that you mentioned, are there any algorithms to remove this, these oscillations? Uh, because I, I, if you have numerical oscillations in the electrophysiology part, this will cause uh, the, the the contraction also to be uh, the not the, the normal contraction. So, what do you do to avoid these oscillations and, and the numerical uh, simulation? Yeah. So, thank you for the questions. I I don't have an, an, any slide here, unfortunately. Um, yeah. uh, so I, I'm talking about uh, a temporal instabilities. Uh, that arises uh, from the interaction between the active force model and the passive mechanics model. Uh, this arises uh, because of the feedback uh, that comes from the mechanical model to the active force generation model in terms of uh, uh, circumere length and time derivative of uh, the, the circumere length. And uh, uh, we have developed uh, a, a stabilization term uh, um, that we have proposed uh, a couple of years ago, um, that uh, is uh, an additional term to be uh, to be added uh, to the momentum equation. Uh, mm -hmm. It is uh, a numerically consistent of first order, and it allows to remove the uh, the uh, oscillations for any choice of the time step. So, with that uh, uh, term, uh, the scheme becomes. Uh, uh, um, unconditionally absolutely stable. And we also proved it uh, um, analytically. Uh, this is one kind of uh, oscillations that there is uh, one other family of uh, oscillations that are also in this case, temporal oscillations that arise be because of the interaction between the active passive mechanics model and the circulation model. This is, uh, these are related to, to the flow across valves. And also in this case, we have introduced a numerically consistent stabilization term that in this case acts on the circulation model. And we have also proved that, that with that term, the schemes becomes uh, uh, unconditionally stable. Uh, mm, it, it, I, I can send you uh, the, the two papers uh, that uh, I, 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 I was mentioning. And uh, yeah. Thank you. I hope that Thank you for the elaborate uh, answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any any other questions before we end the meeting? Yeah, I had uh, I had thought of something while you were uh, lecturing. You had mentioned that you made some modeling choices, which actually made for dramatic improvements in the simulations. And these modeling choices are ultimately of a physiological nature. Now, I'm I'm personally a total outsider to the field. And I just want to know whether these modeling cho choices are actually innovative innovations for uh, practitioners in the sense that they have learned something due to your exercise that they had not appreciated fully before. 
Is that the case? So what, what do you mean by practitioners? The I mean, uh, cardi cardiologists. Uh. Yeah. Uh, mm, well, no, I don't think that uh, they've learned something from, from these uh, uh, choices of uh, reducing the model to a simpler one. No, I didn't mean that. I meant the choices that you made actually in the physiological modeling when you were talking about dependence on length or... Uh, you ah, talking... okay. Yeah. These, uh, these you mentioned actually led to significant improvements and the ability of the models to capture the essential behavior. And I was wondering whether this is something that you guys managed to implement that was already understood or this is something that was not fully appreciated that you brought to light. Yeah. Uh, so, in this case, uh, uh, it is this, the second case that you mentioned. Uh, it is something that, so uh, let me say that this is very, uh, these are very recent uh, uh, results. Uh, so, uh, we have talked with some clinicians. They were not aware of a, a physiological explanation of this phenomena. Mm. And uh, so, uh, with the clinician that we that we talked with, uh, they this for for them it was in an innovative explanation. Okay, I don't know whether there are some other explanation. Uh, maybe our explanation is wrong, so I cannot say. But at least uh, this was something that we did not know at the beginning. So. It's not that we wanted to replicate something and we succeeded, but uh, just by uh, starting from physics uh, principles, uh, we obtained something that uh, reproduced uh, something that we, we didn't know. So I believe that this is a, a good indication that we could have found something, but at, so far it's, uh, we, we, we cannot say for sure. Thank you. I just want to iterate, uh, reiterate that it was truly uh, a treat uh, listening to your uh, lecture. And I hope we, uh, it's unfortunate we had to host you virtually. And I hope we'll have the pleasure of hosting you and team uh, in person here in Beirut. Uh, we have a fantastic medical school, and I think it will make for a wonderful uh, synergy for us to be able to engage in a conversation at the level of the work that you guys have been doing. So thank you again uh, for uh, agreeing to give this talk. Thanks to Fatima for making uh, facilitating this. And uh, we look forward to hosting you live in Beirut uh, soon, I hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. It will be a pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, thank you very much, Francisco, again, for this uh, very nice and uh, amazing talk. And we are looking forward for your uh, uh, for your uh, also talk during the uh, workshop in October. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you, you all.